Well, happy anniversary, church. We are 61 years old today. Man, that's impressive. That is wonderful. Uh, I'm just here to tell you that I, I love our church, and um, I think it's the best church around. And uh, you say, well, you have to say that. You're the pastor. Well, I suppose maybe you could, could say that about me, but uh, I really do believe it, and uh, from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. In fact, when uh, my wife and I had just been married about six months, and I was just finishing in Bible college, and um, God had placed such a burden on me to come back home. This is the church that I grew up in, and uh, there was just something about it. I had to be back here. And so I moved, my wife and I moved from Knoxville, Tennessee, all the way back here to Cleveland, Ohio. At that point, there wasn't a position uh, for us to serve on the, on the staff here, and, uh, and yet we just knew that this is where the Lord wanted us. And so I tell people all the time, if I lived anywhere near here, I'd be a member of this church. And I can say that because I lived in Knoxville, and I moved all the way back here so that I could join the Cleveland Baptist Church. I mean it sincerely. It's a wonderful place. It's not a perfect place because I'm a member of this church, and I'm not a perfect person, and so are you, many of you, uh, but it is a great place, and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. And I think back to myself, and in my mind, I think back 61 years ago on this weekend, the second Sunday of August in 1958, I think maybe there were just 11 people that gathered in a house that actually is now torn down, not too far from here. Uh, there was a home on Memphis Avenue, and uh, right there in the living room, and from such humble beginnings, God has given us this, and we're so very, very thankful for it. And uh, by the way, the, the truths that they sang in that song just a moment ago, we believe, we believe those things 61 years ago. We still believe those things today. Amen. And uh, why? Because it's truth, and the truth of the Word of God never changes. If the mountains are cast into the sea, or uh, if a kingdom's crumble, this truth remains. We believe these things, and uh, we're thankful for it. Let's take our Bibles today, if, we, if you will, and go with me to the book of Mark. Mark chapter number 7 is where we'll find our text. I hope you'll come back tonight. And uh, tonight, of course, we'll have our Sunday evening service. And uh, Brother uh, Goodman mentioned just a moment ago, we will have a snack fellowship after the evening service. Uh, I've invited uh, Brother Alan Jenkins to preach for us. Uh, Brother Jenkins, for over 40 years, was the pastor of the Columbia Road Baptist Church in North Olmsted, Ohio. Uh, but prior to going there, he grew up here in our church, and so I think it's fitting that he be here on anniversary Sunday. And uh, he'll be preaching for us. I also want to let you know that we are receiving a special anniversary Sunday offering throughout this day. And uh, we are giving uh, towards the church, not for us to take and do something special ourselves, uh, but we're giving to give towards this ministry that Brother Jenkins uh, founded and oversees. It's known as Nehemiah's Network. And it is a crisis response type of an organization in which if there's a hurricane or some earthquake or some other natural disaster, uh, there is not far from here, right off of Puritus Avenue, there's a warehouse just stocked with goods, and, uh, and there's just a truckloads of things that can go out right away, get into those places to give them things uh, that they would need during a time like that that might be scarce. And so uh, we're happy to partner with them. We've done some special things with them before. And so if you'd like to give to that today, just simply do it online. And there should be, again, a little uh, designation there for Nehemiah's Network or on your envelope. You can just write down Nehemiah's Network and what you're giving towards and then anything that comes in tonight that is cash in the offering will go right to them. And I certainly hope to be a blessing to them. Would you stand with me as we, as we read the scripture today? Mark chapter number 7 is where we'll find our text. We're going to begin reading in verse number 24. And we're going to read down through verse number 30 of Mark chapter number 7. Look what the Bible says. It says, And from thence he arose, speaking of Jesus, and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon, and entered into a house, and would have no man know it. But he could not be hid. For a certain woman, whose young daughter had an unclean spirit, heard of him, and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it unto the dogs. She answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord. Yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For this saying, go thy way. The devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out, and her daughter laid upon the bed. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, we thank you for our church. 
Lord, thank you for the privilege to be able to worship here each and every Sunday. Thank you for the history that we have. Thank you for the men that have stood in this pulpit over the years and have opened the timeless, true Word of God and have preached it with boldness, with power, and with authority. Lord, we stand here today so unworthy to stand in this place, but so grateful for the opportunity. Thankful that just as one stood 61 years ago today with the same Bible in a, certainly a much different place, a much smaller congregation, Lord, we, we have not changed the Bible that we preach from, and you have not changed. You're always the same. And Lord, you've been saving lost sinners here all of these years, and we're praying that you would do more of that today. Lord, you've changed lives in this place. Oh, how we beg and plead that you would change lives here today. Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit's power. Help us as we attempt to preach this very, very simple message on the subject of prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. The title of the message this morning is Lessons for Those Who Will Pray. Lessons for Those Who Will Pray. E.M. Bounds was an author, and he's most uh, commonly known for his writings on prayer. And E.M. Bounds wrote the following, The prayers of God's saints are the capital stock in heaven by which Christ carries on his great work upon the earth. Great throes and mighty convulsions in the world have come about as a result of these prayers. The earth has changed, revolutionized. Angels move on more powerful, more rapid wings. And God's policy is shaped when the prayers of his people are more numerous and more efficient. The most important lesson we can learn is how to pray. Prayers outlive the lives of those who utter them, outlive a generation, outlive an age, outlive a world. Prayer is no fitful, short-lived thing. It is no voice crying unheard and unheeded in the silence. It is a voice that goes into God's ear, and it lives as long as God's ear is open to holy pleas, as long as God's heart is alive to holy things. I'm ashamed, I'm ashamed to admit how weak I have been in this area. God's word has so much to say about the subject of prayer. God spoke through Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 56 and verse number 7 when he said this, for mine house shall be called an house of prayer. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter number 33 and verse number, 30, verse number 3, God said this, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. He spoke through the psalmist in Psalm 2, verses 7 and 9, when he said this, I will declare the decree, The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces, like a potter's vessel. Ask of me. That is the condition. God requires, God desires a praying people who are willing and obedient. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter number 7 and verse number 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. I believe a lot of our problems could be solved in our world today if believers we begin to start to ask, to seek, and to knock. During Christ's earthly ministry, his followers asked him a very simple question, and he was happy to answer this question. The question is found in Luke 11 and verse number 1, where the Bible says, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples, I think to myself that Jesus had much to say about prayer, and he taught us some things. Isaiah wrote some things about the subject of prayer. Jeremiah did, and the psalmist did as well. But I'm humbled to think that here in Mark chapter number 7, an unnamed woman who is not even a Jew, I think teaches us some very, very powerful, practical, and urgent, important lessons on the subject of prayer. Many of you know that 
on Sunday, June the 2nd, I was installed as the third pastor here of the Cleveland Baptist Church. And I've had so many people ask me over the last two months or so, how's it going? How are you doing? And uh, that's a really loaded question, isn't it? Uh, I'm doing well, I think. I think. I think the church is doing well, but... I think that lightning was intended for me, but it didn't quite get to where it was supposed to go. It's about the third time that's happened recently. I might need to move on, maybe. I don't know. You know, there's one thing that God has taught me this summer, and that is the power of prayer. Um, many of you remember Brother Dale Bigham, who was here last summer, and he preached a revival for us. And uh, he told me, he said, you know, he said, I know you're going to become pastor here in just the next little while. And he said, I can't fully explain this. He had been a pastor for many years. And he said, but when you become pastor, he said, God's going to, God's going to give you something that you don't have right now. And he said that God's going to take that same thing away from your dad, who was, of course, our former pastor. He said, God's going to take it. He won't need it anymore. He's not the pastor anymore. He said, I, I can only tell you that because I've experienced that. He said, when I, when I left the pastor, he said, God... God took something away. I don't know if it was an anointing or whatever it might have been. He said, because I didn't need it anymore. And I carried that lesson and that thought with me, and, and I wondered what exactly did he mean by that, and what would it, what would it really look like? And the only thing that I can, the only thing that I can tell you is, is that, that he's, he's right about that, and I've experienced it specifically in the last two months in my, in my prayer life. God's ear has been so attentive to me in the last two months. Some of the things that I have prayed for, God has answered in a day's time. I can't explain it. Uh, I can't even imagine that God would be so good to answer my prayers the way that he has. But he's been so faithful. And my desire is that God would do the same thing for you. Because I know some of you carry such heavy burdens. Some of you, you're dealing with things that I can't even begin to imagine what life is like for you. The challenges that you face, the burdens that you bear. I'm here to tell you that if you'll carve out some time each and every morning and you'll fall down on your knees before God, God will listen to you. God will hear you and God delights to answer our prayers. I'm praying that God would teach his people in this congregation how to pray. And I'm giving to our congregation this morning the example of this woman who were never even given her name. She's not a Jew. She's a Greek. She's a Syrophoenician woman. And yet God answered her prayer. I want us to consider four specific thoughts from this passage of Scripture. Number one, I want you to notice that great need hastens urgent prayer. Great need hastens urgent prayer. The Bible tells us in verse number 25 that a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit. A certain woman has a daughter with a demon possession going on in her life. This devil was an outsider. This devil had come into this home and was destroying any peace this family might have enjoyed. And their lives had been interrupted by an intruder, and they were desperate to see this intruder gone. I want you to notice that this woman was very specific in her prayer. Notice she comes to the Lord Jesus, and she fell at his feet, and she asked the question. She besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. You know what I think? I think sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers the way that we might want, because maybe we're not as specific as we ought to be. And this woman, she, she came and she didn't beat around the bush. She didn't, she didn't say, Lord, would you bless all of the people of my country? Lord, would you bless my family? And that's what she wanted, right? She wanted blessing on her family. No, she got specific. She said, Jesus, I want to tell you about a little girl that was born into our home and into our family. She's so precious to us. We love her with all of our heart. But here recently, a devil has possessed her, and we know that you have power. We know that you have ability. Lord Jesus, would you, would you cast this devil out of my little girl? I'm just simply saying that I'm afraid sometimes we're not specific as we ought to be. Do you have a prayer list? 
Do you have specific things on that prayer list? Are there specific names that you're calling out to God? And not just, Lord, bless this person, but Lord, would you, uh, would, would you grow this person? Lord, would you bring this person to where you would have them to be? Lord, I'm so burdened for this person. Lord, would you help me to see this person come to know Christ as their personal Savior? I'm just simply saying that I think God delights in specific prayers. I mean, you know, in your relationship with your spouse, you don't come home and, and, uh, and kind of smile at her and, 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 uh, and, and, and then, you know, go about, no, you're, you're specific with her. How was your day? Well, we know how that goes as men, don't we? How was your day? It was okay. It was good. She wants a little more than that, doesn't she? She wants to know details, you know, what happened here and what happened there. And, uh, and, and, and she should not, men, she should not have to ask you if you love her. You ought to tell her that. Be specific. Be specific in our relationships. But listen, be specific with God. What do you want him to do? And and, and, listen, I know know God knows all things. I get that. I understand all of that. God wants to hear from you. God wants to, to know what you're thinking. God wants you to cry out to him. God wants you to be specific. And she was. Now listen, the devil may not possess your child but cancer might. Financial troubles might have visited your home. Marital problems might be something you're dealing with. Perhaps there's someone in here today who's dealing with depression or some other issue that has come into their life. These things might be something you're contending with. What do you do with great needs? Prayer, listen, prayer should be our first response, not our last resort. How often do we enter into a trial And we pick up the phone and we call everybody and we update our social media status and we call the pastor and we shoot a text out to someone and we shoot an email out and we go online to see how much money we have in the bank account to cover this particular need. Do I I have enough money? How much is the credit limit on our credit card? Where are the Christians who will fall on their knees and bring their needs to God? Oh, I'm so convicted by this. Because there are times I enter into a trial and I do all of the things I just told you about. And the last thing I do is bring it to God. When in reality, that should be the very first thing that I do. The Bible is full of people who had great needs. And they brought them to God through prayer. I share a classic example of this. A woman in the Old Testament by the name of Hannah. We learn of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter number 1. The distinguishing characteristic of Hannah's life was that she was barren. She wanted more than anything in the world to have a child of her own. One year during her annual pilgrimage to the tabernacle in Shiloh, she was especially burdened. The Bible tells us in 1 Samuel chapter number 1 and verse number 10 that while she was in Shiloh, the Bible says she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. She got specific in her prayer. She, she didn't just ask for a child. She said, God, I want a son. And she said, Lord, if you give me a son, I will give him back to you all the days of his life. She vowed that vow. It wasn't all that long after that prayer was prayed that God had seen her great need and he had heard her urgent prayer. And Almighty God blessed Hannah with a child. Notice what she said in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. She said, for this child I prayed. Let me ask you this question. What do you have in your life right now that you can say, I have this because I prayed for it? That's convicting, isn't it? Is there something that you can look at in your life and say, God gave, God gave me this because I prayed for it? Hannah looked at this little boy that she named Samuel and she fell on her knees and she said, right over there, for that child, for this little boy, I prayed. I'm I'm here to tell you prayer works. For this child I prayed and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. Can you imagine how difficult that must have been for Hannah? I mean, all she wanted was this little boy. You don't think maybe there were some moments in which she thought to herself, I wish I wouldn't have vowed that. Because now I've got to give him back. But listen to me, listen to me. She did what she vowed to do. 
And the Bible tells us that God gave her more children. God gave her, I believe, if I remember correctly, six more children that God gave to her. Why? Because she prayed, and she vowed, and she fulfilled her vow, and God blessed her. What do you have in your life? What do you have in your life that you could say, God gave this to me through my prayers? What burden are you carrying today? What great need is present in your life? Great needs, heavy burdens, they are not a waste. They're not an intrusion, for they draw us into meaningful, effectual, fervent, purposeful, intense seasons of prayer. We see here great need hastens urgent prayer. But notice, consider the second lesson, and that is the priority of humility for those who will pray. And this woman teaches us some lessons on humility. There are several things that I find in her prayer and in the way that she approached Christ that reveal a spirit of humility. By the way, can I tell you that the Bible says that God resisteth the proud but giveth grace unto the humble. Amen. So in other words, you, you may wonder, why am I not getting my prayers answered? Is it perhaps because you have tolerated a spirit of pride in your heart and in your life? This woman came to Christ, and she had emptied herself of self. She was not functioning in a spirit of pride, but in complete and total dependence and humility. Notice several things. First of all, her posture reveals her humility. Look in verse number 25. For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. She was worshiping him. She was admitting that he was who he claimed to be. Listen, only God deserves worship and praise. And she was giving that to him. The Bible says that she fell down at his feet. We would assume that she either completely laid on the ground at his feet or she was at least on her knees. She had taken a, a, a position of humility. She had lowered herself in his presence. I remember as a little boy coming to our church's prayer meeting seven o'clock on Sunday mornings, and I am 40 years old, and that prayer meeting has been going on as long as I uh, can remember, and it's still going on today. A group of men met here this morning, and we knelt on our knees, and that was the first, I suppose that might have been the first place that I, uh, that I learned how to kneel when I was praying. I said, learned how to kneel. I just, just saw they're doing it, and I, I began to do it as well. I can, remember, I can remember moments in, as, a, as a child when I, would, uh, when I would get up in the middle of the night or early, early in the morning to get a drink of water or whatever the case might be, and I'd come down into my living room and I would see my dad kneeling at his couch and, and, uh, and, and praying uh, over, uh, over us, I'm sure, and over our church and, and, uh, and over his life and begging and pleading God for blessing. And when, I, when it's appropriate, when I can, I, I, I prefer when I'm praying, I prefer to be on my knees. I think God's pleased with that. I think it's a, I think it's a posture that he is, he is pleased with. And I, I'm not saying that you know, God answers prayers of people who, who kneel down and God doesn't answer prayers for people. There's some that perhaps cannot kneel. Perhaps then it'd be that God would see your heart. But I'm just simply saying this woman, she took the posture of someone who was humbling themselves. She knelt down at his feet and she began to pray. She began to plead with him and to beg for God to look favorably upon her and upon her need. And I think it's appropriate that, that we do the same. That when we have opportunity that we kneel down. That we humble ourselves, that our posture reveal our humility, but there's a second thing that reveals her humility, and that is her plea. Again, in verse number 26, that she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. You know, when you ask, when you ask for something, that, that requires humility. Because you're admitting that you do not have it in and of yourself, and so you've got to go to someone else to get it. And so here is this woman, and, and, and we'd have to assume that she had tried some other things. She perhaps had taken her daughter to a doctor. The doctor couldn't help. Perhaps there were some other things that they would have done for someone who was demon-possessed in that day and in that age, and perhaps she had done all of those things. Maybe there was some type of home remedy that someone would have prescribed, and so she had got, gathered the materials for that. She'd given it to her daughter, and nothing worked. Maybe she had been to other religious leaders. Maybe she had paid some type of a fee for their religious services for them to pray over her, and everything that she had done had failed. So she came to Christ. She had heard of him. 
She had heard that he had unusual power. And she came to him and she said, I can't do this. I'm only coming. I'm asking. I'm begging. I'm pleading with you. Lord, would you cast this devil out of my daughter? When she had exhausted all of their options, she flung herself at Christ and asked for him to do what she and every other man was incapable of doing. There's a third aspect of this woman's life that reveals her humility, and that is, thirdly, her, the absence of bitterness that she had reveals her humility. Look in verse number 27. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs. Now let's just be frank. This response seems out of character, doesn't it, for the Lord? This doesn't seem right. Why would you say that? Why would, you, why would you verbalize that? Even if you were thinking it, why would you say that? I read quite a bit from Matthew Henry and some of his commentaries, and here's, here's what he believes he was saying. He was saying, let the Jews have all the miracles wrought for them that they have occasion for, who are in a particular manner God's chosen people. And let not that which was intended for them be thrown to those who are not of God's family, and who have not knowledge of him and interest in him, which they have, and who are as dogs in comparison of them, vile and profane, and who are as dogs to them, snarling at them, spiteful toward them, and ready to worry them. Matthew Henry would go on to write, where Christ knows the faith of poor supplicants to be strong, he sometimes delights to try it and put it to the stretch. In other words, Jesus, listen, Jesus knew this woman. He had created her. Jesus was trying to reveal something in her. He knew how great of faith she had. And he knew what she had been through, and he knew what her response would be to these comments. In other words, he was trying to draw something out of her so that others could see it, so that it could be recorded in the pages of Scripture, so you and I could learn from it. Most would have been greatly offended at the way he communicated to her. Her need and her humility protected her from offense. She, listen, she knew who he was, that he was the Messiah, that he was the Lord. But even more importantly, listen, she knew who she was. She knew that she was what he said she was, a Greek from a Syrophoenician country. He was a Jew sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And you and I, when we truly recognize who we are, great sinners, it's a wonder, it's a wonder that any of our prayers are heard by God. It's a wonder that He would be in tune to what we would have to say. You and I are such vile, wicked people with a sin nature that, uh, that, that, that destroys us and, and, it, and, it, and it captivates us everywhere we go. We're in bondage to it. And yet the God of heaven wants to hear from you. If you knew if you knew someone had done something horrible and awful to you or to your family or just in general, you probably might want to distance yourself from that person. I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to be in a relationship with them. I mean, listen to what they've done. I'm justified in, in not being close to them. I, I'm justified in giving them the cold shoulder. Aren't you glad God didn't do that to you? God knows every thought you've ever, you've ever thought. God knows every word you've ever said. God knows every deed you've ever done. He knows every place you've ever been. He knows everything that your eyes have looked on. He knows everything that your ears have heard. He knows all of these things, and yet God still wants to hear from you. Isaiah, when he saw, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up and in, his, in his temple in this throne room, he says, woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. And yet God was still wanting to hear from him. God still wanted to use him. The absence of bitterness that she has reveals her humanity. She didn't get upset when he called her a dog. She said, you're right, Lord. I'm exactly what you're calling me. That is who I am. I'm not a Jew. You're sent from God. You're sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You came unto your own. I get all of that, and I realize I, 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 by birth I'm not that. But Lord, I still believe in you. I'm, I'm not going to get offended. Lord, I still, I still believe you can do what you said you're going to do, and, and everything you've said about me is true. That's right. But Lord, would you still heal 
my little girl. Notice thirdly, we learn a third lesson. That is the necessity of persistence for those who will pray. Look at verse number 28. He had just got done saying the children are first to be filled. It is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it on the dogs. Notice her response. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord. Notice the next word, yet. Yes, Lord, yet. I wonder, I wonder if that would have been me. I'd fallen at him. I mean, at his feet, I'm kneeling there. Perhaps I'm weeping. I have put myself out there big time. There's other people standing around, and Jesus responds to me the way he responded to this woman. And probably, I probably would have picked myself up and walked away, not saying another word. Offended, perhaps humiliated, but not this woman. Instead, she persisted. She agreed with him that that, that, that she was exactly what he said she was, but then she said this, but the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. She, listen, this woman was not asking for a whole loaf of bread. She wasn't even asking for just a, just a, a, just a little slice. All she said, she said, all I want, all I need is just a crumb. Because a crumb that comes from Christ is worth the world's supply of bread. We learned of that when Jesus took five loaves of bread and two fish and he broke it and he distributed it. Perhaps she'd heard of that story and she said, Lord, I don't need a loaf of bread. I don't need even a slice of bread. All I need is just a tiny little crumb, just a tiny little morsel. If you'll give me that, I know that my needs will be met because she knew who he was. In Luke 11, after giving the model prayer, in verses two to four, Jesus tells a story about a man who has a guest come into his house in the middle of the night. This man is unprepared for this guest, and he has nothing to offer him. In those days, they, they didn't go to the grocery store like you and I do and stock up for a week or two or two, you know, a week and a half. They, they would go daily to the market, and, and perhaps they just had enough money to be able to buy food for that specific day. They went to bed, and they trusted we'd make enough money the next day, and we'd be able to go out and buy some, some more food to feed our family. And so this would not be all that strange during that era. They would have understood that. We're reading like, who doesn't have any food in their house, you know? I don't have any food in my house. My kids are always like, Dad, we don't have anything to eat in here, you know? Am I the only one that has kids that say that? I open the refrigerator and I can't even, I mean, there's so much stuff in there. And I go to the, to the cabinet, but we don't have anything to eat. Where are you girls at? Yeah, they're out here. All right, I'm looking at you. That's right. But in this house, there really wasn't anything to eat. And so here's this, here's this guest, he comes, and it was very rude for them not to give them something to eat. And so he, he makes his way out of his house. He probably puts his robe on and maybe puts his slippers on, and he makes his way down the, down the path, and he goes to the guy next to him, and he knocks on the door. And he says, give me something to eat. He says, I have a guest that has been on a long journey, and I have nothing to give him. Now listen, you, you can do a lot of mean things to me. But the worst thing you can do to me is wake me up in the middle of the night. I mean, that is the absolute worst. I hate to be woken up in the middle of the night. I think I've told you that before. It's, it's no fun. I am grouchy and cantankerous. You ask my wife, you know. And uh, I, am, I am this mean, nasty person if you wake me up in the middle of the night. So this guy, he's in his bed, and this door is knocking, and he says, what do you want? And the man says, I, I need some bread. A guy has come on a long journey. I need some bread. And he says, we are all in bed. My children are in bread. I'm not giving you any bread. What do you want? Told you. I don't have anything to feed this guy. Give me some bread. Jesus Jesus said that in Luke chapter number 11, he said, because of his importunity, the man would rise up from his bed and he would go downstairs or whatever the houses were set up in those days and he would take some bread that he had and he would give it to this man just to get him off of his back, just to keep him from knocking a third time so that they didn't wake up the children. The word importunity, it means pressing, solicitation, urgent request, 
application for a claim or favor which is urged with troublesome frequency or pertinacity. In other words, this man refuses to take no for an answer. This guy laying in his bed with his children laying in bed with him, he's like, here, here, the point is this, he, he, he understands, if I continue to turn this guy down, the door is going to continue knocking. He's not going away. The point is this, listen, that's how you and I ought to be with God. We knock. And God doesn't answer the way that we would have hoped or we would have wanted. And how quickly do we say, okay, throw up our arms, walk away. Prayed for our loved one to be saved for, you know, three weeks and God didn't save him, so I guess that's just not meant to be. I prayed for a better job that would allow me to attend church more faithfully, but God didn't give it, so I guess it's just not meant to be. I prayed for a healthier marriage, but I wasn't willing to work on it. She wasn't willing to work on it. And God didn't seem to change our hearts, so I guess that's just the way it is. We'll go our separate ways. And listen, God says, you keep coming. You keep knocking. You keep asking. You keep seeking. Don't give up. This woman, yes, Lord, yet, yet. I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. You're the only one that can help. I'm not walking away. I'm remind, I remind you. Luke 11, 9 and 10, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Notice number four, and we'll be done. Number four, prayer. We learned this lesson. Prayer is the key that unlocks the power of God. In verses 29 and 30, the Bible says, And he said unto her, For this saying, Go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out, and her daughter laid upon the bed. Do you remember the last prayer that God answered in your life? For me, it was Tuesday. I won't go into detail, but I'm telling you, I asked God specifically for something on Tuesday morning, and by Tuesday afternoon, he had given it to me. Incredible. What about you? When was the last time God answered one of your prayers? The scriptures are full of prayer promises. God wants to hear from his people and show his power in their lives. God works through prayer. Listen, God saves lost souls through the power of prayer. God empowers the saints through prayer. He builds churches because people pray. He meets financial needs because people pray. He drives the devil away because of prayer. Why don't you pray? When you are weary in body and soul, cumbered with many a care, when work is claiming its strength-taking toll, make it a matter of prayer. When you're discouraged, distraught, or dismayed, sinking almost in despair, remember there's one who will come to your aid if you'll make it a matter of prayer. And when you are lost in the world's tangled maze, when life seems a hopeless affair, direction will come for all of your ways if you'll make it a matter of prayer.